Well, hi, welcome to Coffee with Kalefi. A um, couple of things I want to make uh, known right off the front. This is going to be a 90 minute or today, so uh, get something to drink and have a comfortable seat because we're going to go a little bit longer than we typically do. But um, And the hydronics issue, this isn't quite on the street yet. It's still at the printer. This should be uh, in the mail in August sometime. The PDF of this is available online if you want the, uh, the slides for this. And we are working on a digital format for this. Um, we're hoping Mary was saying that September maybe to have a launch on that. You're probably familiar with how the digital ones work where you can just kind of scroll through them and there's links and stuff in there. So that's going to be even a little bit more user friendly. They're going to be available as hard copies still. You know, I like the hard copies. A lot of people do. That's not going away, but we're trying to make them a little bit more available in some more uh, uh, format. So you'll see the PDF available, you see the hard copy available, and then the uh, digital version coming up uh, by September. So, and there's our boy, John. Uh, many of you know him. I think he does a great job on these presentations and uh, judging by the viewership, uh, I think you agree with that. So I know you've got a lot to talk about. Hi to Max, hi to Norman, some of my buddies that are online today. And of course the staff at Cleffy that helps uh, put all this together in the back end logistics. We will, if you type in questions, Cody and I will be watching those and Kevin, everybody uh, will be answering those, but we will have time at the end to so save up any uh, typed in questions and we can do them at the end so you, you don't lose your rhythm here and you can keep keep rolling. So to make a long story long, let's go. Okay, Hot Rod, thank you. Very good summary, very good introduction. Uh, we are back with part two on uh, Coffee with Galefi on applying air to water heat pump systems in hydronics. Uh, part one was back in October. If you happen to miss part one, it's available on the Kalefi YouTube channel. Um, I do have a link up here, but uh, probably the simpler way would be, well, on the PDF, you can just click on that link and it'll take you to it, or uh, just go to YouTube and, and uh, look at Kalefi's channel. Uh, many, many different videos up there. In part one, it was an introduction. We talked about the very basic concepts of what an air to water heat pump is. We looked briefly at performance, characteristics. We talk quite a bit about why the market is likely to grow for this type of heat pump in North America. And just, just to summarize, air to water heat pumps are extensively used in the Asian market and the European market. Uh, I think the last uh, numbers that I saw, well over 2 million air to water heat pumps per year globally. Uh, in North America, it's a small market at present, but we're seeing more and more interest in the product. We're seeing more and more interest from manufacturers in rounding out their offerings, whether it be uh, heat pumps as an, as an option to boilers or perhaps air to water heat pumps as an option to ductless mini splits or perhaps geothermal. So it's, it's not, I'm not trying to position it that this is going to take over the market from all other types of heat sources. It's simply going to be another option and there are going to be good applications for it. So I want to do a very quick review uh, and uh, I promise we will get through this quickly. Uh, if you have never heard of an air to water heat pump, it is a machine that in heating mode, let's say we're in the winter, we're basically extracting low temperature heat from outside air by blowing air across an evaporator coil that is part of a refrigeration system. You see it here. And we're upgrading the temperature of that heat using the refrigeration process. We're, we're sending that gas into a compressor. We're bringing up the pressure and the temperature. And then we're sending that hot gas into a water cooled condenser. So we're passing a in this case, we're passing a stream of water from a hydronic system through a heat exchanger, absorbing the heat from that condenser, and then taking that heat in and distributing it through the building. And like most heat pumps today, we have a reversing valve. So that same machine can go to a chilled water production mode in the summer, uh, where we are extracting heat from a stream of water. So again, we have a stream here being pumped in to what is now the evaporator in the heat pump. And that gets uh, cooled. So we have the chill water going back into the building for distribution. And then the heat is rejected outside. So that's a very basic four function refrigeration system, uh, very similar to the refrigeration concept used in geothermal heat pumps or even ductless mini splits, just a different physical configuration based on extracting heat 
and dissipating heat to outside air and then tying into a hydronic distribution system. Uh, there are a couple different hardware configurations for air to water heat pumps. Uh, what is known as a monoblock, and, and actually that's how they do spell that in Europe, no K. Um, I like to use the term self-contained. All the parts and pieces necessary for the heat pump, including the refrigerant, are put together at a factory. The refrigerant is added. You buy it with the refrigerant already in. So essentially you're making water or a solution of water and antifreeze, you're making those hydronic connections to the outdoor unit. You're bringing the, you're extending the hydronic system outside, connecting it to the unit. Um, in a very warm climate where there's very little chance of freezing, I know in some of the uh, Southern European applications, probably some of the Southern Asian applications, these units do operate directly with water. In most of North America, especially up where hydronic heating is more common, you have uh, sustained freezing conditions in the winter. And of course, the potential problem is a prolonged power outage with water in the unit. Uh, let's say there's no backup power, there's no heat tracing, obviously it's going to freeze and, and damage the unit. So we can set up the system, and I'll show you examples of systems today that are set up to operate with antifreeze. Uh, many of the manufacturers of monoblock style air to water heat pumps require antifreeze. They, they simply don't want to have their product in at the risk of freezing. Now, another option that is possible is down here, and that is to set up a generously sized heat exchanger. Typically, it's a uh, flat plate stainless steel heat exchanger uh, and have the glycol between the heat exchanger and the outdoor monoblock heat pump, and then the balance of the system would operate on water. The key concept when you do this, a uh, couple things here, you do have to have two circulators because we're, we're creating two independent circuits there, and you wanna make sure that you generously size that flat plate heat exchanger. Uh, we don't wanna see what's called an approach temperature difference over about five degrees Fahrenheit, and that would be the difference between the hot antifreeze solution coming in from the heat pump and the warmed water leaving the heat exchanger and going to the balance of the system. We want that difference between those two temperatures to be as small as we, we can get it. So a, a practical limit is no more than about five degrees Fahrenheit. So that works. Uh, it might be appropriate where you've got a system with a lot of volume in it and you really don't wanna use perhaps a 30% solution of, of uh, propylene glycol throughout the entire system. It might be an older system where you, you just wanna keep the water side of it isolated from antifreeze. So those are uh, uh, two fundamental ways you can pipe up a uh, monoblock. Now, the other type of system is a split system. And this is more typical of what a central air-to-air -air heat pump or central air conditioning system would have. We have an outdoor unit, of, oftentimes it's called the Com, um, condenser, especially in an AC system, a uh, air conditioning system, because it's where the heat from cooling the building is being dissipated. But it, it also, in a heat pump, functions as the evaporator in the heating mode of operation. Now, we have refrigerant lines that come in from the outdoor unit, and they go to an indoor unit, and the indoor unit has the refrigerant to water heat exchanger, uh, some of these have circulators built in. Uh, some of them have other ancillary items like a pressure relief valve built in. Uh, controls are usually, uh, some of the controls are located in the indoor unit. And just to give you an idea, it's roughly the size of a small wall hung boiler. And you'll see there's a couple pipes coming out of the bottom down here, and these would go off to the balance of system. So fundamentally, we have monoblock systems, self-contained. We have split systems. In a split system, you have the advantage that there's no water in the outdoor unit. So you don't really have to use antifreeze, um, assuming it's not needed in the balance of the system. The downside to the split system for a plumber, perhaps, would be you do need to connect a refrigerant line set, pull a vacuum, uh, well, pressure test the line set first with nitrogen, pull a vacuum, and then Typically, the outdoor units are supplied with enough refrigerant 
already in the unit so that when you open a service valve, that refrigerant just goes into the evacuated line set and you're ready to run. So uh, if it's a company that only does water side work that doesn't have refrigerant training, uh, a split system will probably require uh, some type of a, a subcontractor or a person that can uh, attach that line set and uh, evacuate it and then release the charge. Now, one of the technologies that has really pushed air source heat pumps uh, along into what are referred to as either low ambient air source heat pumps, or sometimes you'll hear the term cold climate air source heat pumps. It's a technique called enhanced vapor injection. And to show you that, we'll start with a, a non-EVI system. This is a standard refrigeration circuit where in an air to water heat pump, we've got that outdoor coil and in the heating mode operation, uh, again, we're using the outdoor coil and the, and the fans to absorb low grade heat from the outside air. We've got the compressor and we're sending our hot gas from the compressor into a heat exchanger and we're extracting that heat with a stream of water and then we are taking the condensed refrigerant through a thermal expansion valve, lowering its pressure which causes the temperature to drop and then we go back and repeat the cycle. So, uh, again, a very basic four major component refrigeration cycle. Now, an EVI refrigeration circuit adds some hardware. The basic idea behind this is that we want to cool the liquid refrigerant coming off of the condenser unit. So let's, again, we're in heating mode operation now where um, we've got a higher pressure, lower temperature liquid re refrigerant coming out of the condenser. And instead of sending it just straight across to the TXV, we're going to go into another heat exchanger. And it's often referred to as a subcooler. And the idea is we want to cool that liquid refrigerant to a lower temperature. The lower we can get the liquid refrigerant temperature, the lower we can operate that outdoor coil. And obviously, the lower we can operate the outdoor coil, the colder the climate can be and still allow reasonably good capacity and reasonably good coefficient of performance on the heat pump. <clears throat> so how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to send some of the liquid through the lower side of that heat exchanger, but we're, we're going to open this solenoid valve and we're going to send the other portion of the liquid refrigerant into a expansion device, an electronic expansion valve that's going to lower the pressure down and that's going to cause a cooling effect. When we lower the pressure, we lower the temperature. So we're getting a cooling effect. We're getting, in effect, another evaporation of refrigerant. So what is leaving out here on this pink line is, is a gas, but it is not at the low inlet suction pressure of the compressor. It's at an intermediate pressure. So what do we do with that gas? Well, we've got to inject that into a special compressor. And there are compressors that are built, they're scroll-based compressors that have these gas injection ports built in. So they're cleverly designed so that that gas gets injected after the scroll set has actually closed off the inlet so that that gas cannot go backwards in the refrigeration or backwards out of the compressor. And this does several things. Um, basically, it cools the liquid more before it gets to the TXV. Uh, it increases the mass flow of refrigerant going through the system, which under cold conditions increases the capacity of the machine. And it allows these air source heat pumps to get down to some very low outdoor ambient temperatures. Uh, there's at least one manufacturer on the market now that uh, rates the product to operate down to minus 22 degree Fahrenheit. And even in cold northern climates, you, you're perhaps going to see that a few hours a day. So this has really changed the picture for what, from what air source heat pumps used to be viewed as. Back in the 80s and the 90s, the idea was, well, air source heat pumps are good. They work in southern states. They, they might work up in places like Pennsylvania, Maryland, and so forth. But what about caribou, Maine, or what about uh, 
you know, uh, Milwaukee or other cold climate applications. Well, air source heat pumps had a connotation. They really weren't suitable for those climates. Uh, this has really changed the game quite a bit on, in that condition. And this is just a graph. It, it shows you a comparison uh, down at the bottom here. We're looking at refrigerant evaporating temperatures. And um, <clears throat> it shows you that uh, this dark blue area, this represents a, uh, an injection, uh, vapor injection compressor. You can see we can actually get down in the range of minus 40 degree evaporating temperature. Now that's not the outside air temperature. That's the temperature of the refrigerant, the coldest possible temperature of the refrigerant. But that substantially increases the lower end of the outdoor temperature range where these air source heat pumps can work. And EVI technology is not used just in uh, air to water heat pumps. It's, it's used in other types of heat pumps as well. So we're going to go to a poll question now. Okay. Are you planning to use an air to water heat pump in an upcoming installation during the next 12 months? And that's just a yes or no answer. And um, Hot Rod is kind of keeping track of those numbers coming in. Yeah, we'll watch it for a couple of seconds here and then we'll, uh, we'll give you the results if, uh, as they come in here. Yeah, it's pretty much neck and neck going through this as the, as the ticker's going up. So um, I think, see, the bottom line to this, we hope the takeaway at the end of the day is how to properly apply this piece of equipment. Just don't assume that you can go and take a boiler out of a customer's house and put one of these in, everything's going to be fine. So there we have it. So um, yes, 53%, no, 47%. So okay. Uh, well, that's encouraging. That's encouraging. Um, I know we've got a large audience today, and uh, uh, it's showing that this technology is getting some, at least some interest and some traction. Okay. Now, um, I want to get into a little bit more detail. Uh, let's talk about the, again, kind of a review at first, but we what we will eventually want to do is find out at least a simulation or an estimate of what kind of performance can we expect from a given heat pump that has a, a, you know, a manufacturer specified performance range in a given building, in a given climate. All those factors have to come together. Obviously, the building determines the load that we're working with. The climate determines the air temperature range that we're working with, and certainly the heat pump uh, has a performance characteristic. Now, a typical air to water heat pump. Um, its performance is strongly dependent on outdoor temperature. So you can see on the lower axis here that the heating capacity of, of this particular heat pump, uh, I mean, it's more than double at warm outside temperatures like 60, 70 degrees compared to what it would be at minus 10. The other thing that affects the performance is the condensing temperature. The higher the water temperature that the heat pump is producing, the lower its heating capacity. And this just goes back to fundamental thermodynamics of heat pumps. Okay, so you can see here, if we can operate that heat pump with 95 degree Fahrenheit leaving temperature, that would be going into some type of a very low temperature, perhaps a radiant floor panel with close tube spacing in a well insulated building. Uh, we're, we're gonna get this upper performance curve. Uh, but as we increase temperature, we go up to 113 and eventually up to 131, you can see our capacity does drop off. So we need to build that effect into our performance simulation. And it's a similar story with coefficient of performance. The warmer we operate the hydronic system, the higher the water temperature that we're requiring, the lower the coefficient of performance. And coefficient of performance is essentially its output divided by input. So we're we're, as designers, we're trying to optimize the coefficient of performance in the system, because ultimately that'll affect the number of kilowatt hours of electricity that a given heat pump in a given building is going to require. And I, I'd like to explain this, uh, again, I'm sure many folks watching today are familiar with this concept, but when we look at a heat pump as just a very generic idea, we have a source media, a low temperature media, it could be water, could be air, that we're extracting low temperature heat from, and we're, we're moving that heat, we're pumping that heat to a high temperature media. And the thermodynamics guys would call this, uh, the low temperature media the source of the heat, and then the, the word sink means where we're dissipating the heat. Well, the greater that temperature lift is, 
the lower the heating capacity and the lower the COP, the heat pump's going to be. We can't really change the source media temperature. Obviously, we don't, we don't have uh, control over that outside temperature, but as designers, we do have control over how hot the water has to be. And the bottom line is very simple. The lower you can keep that water temperature, the better that heat pump is going to perform. So it, it is very important, as, as uh, Bob was saying, don't just cut up boiler out of, a, for, for example, a baseboard system and drop a heat pump in and expect that that's going to be a workable system. Uh, you've got to make sure that the balance of the system, everything but the heat pump, is compatible with low water temperature operation to get a, a good performing system. Now, um, this is kind of for the uh, the geeks out there, the engineers that say, well, how do you model this? How do I how do I put numbers on this? Well, if you look at that curve on that graph, that's a, a curve that a mathematician would say is a nice polynomial, okay? It's got a nice uh, continuous smooth upward curve to it. So we can actually come up with an equation that fits that curve, it, you know, the concept of curve fitting. And down at the bottom here, this is a, uh, this is a, what would be called a second order polynomial. Basically, you'll see these numbers, K1, K2, K3, K4, or I should say these, these parameters, K1 through K4. You have to come up with those through curve fitting. You can use a spreadsheet to do this. Many graphing programs have the capability of doing this today. Uh, essentially what you're doing is you're going through an algorithm that is going to come up with these values, K1 through K4, that would best fit that curve. And the way, the way I like to look at it on the graph, these, this first term right here with the Ks, K1 and K2, that basically determines where the starting point is on that vertical axis. And then the rest of that equation determines this curvature up here. So for a given heat pump, with a spreadsheet or with a graphing program, we can we can come up with actual numbers for K1 through K4 that give us a pretty good um, fit to that performance data. And we can do a similar thing for the coefficient of performance. It's, it's a similar type of curve. I use C1 through C4 there for these coefficients that we would find through curve fitting. There are other ways to do this, uh, depending on what the performance curve looks like. But in general, most heat pumps would would allow this form of an equation to be a pretty good fit to their performance. Okay. Now, another concept with air source heat pumps, and this applies air to water as well as air to air type heat pumps. It's called balance point, and it's a simple idea. If you look at the blue line here, this represents a simple linear model for heat loss from a building. When it's 65 degrees outside, the assumption in this graph is that the building needs no heat input from its auxiliary, from its heating system. Internal heat gains are sufficient to keep the building comfortable. And as it gets colder, you can see that heat load increases. Well, here's a heating capacity curve for a heat pump. And as it gets colder outside, as we've talked about, the capacity goes down. So at some point, these curves are going to cross. At some point, the output of that heat pump is exactly equal to the, what the load is. And that's called the balance point. And a perfect world would be where the building always, the outside temperature in this case looks like about 27 degrees would be the balancing point. Well, if it just stayed 27 degrees outside, the heat pump could run continuously and exactly match the heating load of the building. Well, obviously that doesn't happen. So to the left of the balance point, the heat pump actually has more capacity than it needs to heat the building. So it's going to cycle on and off or some of the newer heat pumps would reduce compressor speed and modulate down on capacity. And it simply means we, we have the ability to produce heat at a rate greater than what the building needs it. Perhaps we could divert some of that heat to another load like domestic water heating. To the right of the balancing point, You've got the opposite condition. The load exceeds the output. So we need some form of supplemental heat. It could be a boiler. It could be electric heating elements. It could be room by room heating elements. Honestly, it could be a wood stove. If somebody you know, says, well, if the heat pump can't quite keep up, I'll light the wood stove. I always talk about that 
uh, I'd like to, in a sense, counsel them. You know, you may be happy with that. Do you really want to design a house so that if you sell it someday, the next person has to use the wood stove? So we we tend to say, yeah, let's design a system so it is capable of fully automatically heating the building, and then you just save some money by using a wood stove. Now, if you go to a bigger heat pump, a higher capacity heat pump, the balance point shifts to a lower temperature. All right, so instead of a balance point at 27, looks like we're down around maybe 16 here. And then if we go to a smaller heat pump, opposite effect, our balance point shifts to higher temperature. So the capacity of the heat pump in relationship to the load of the building will determine that balance point. Okay. Now, uh, what we're leading up to here is a spreadsheet that's going to model the performance of these systems. So we need to have some way to calculate, at least estimate what the building load is as the outdoor temperature varies. Well, we're using a very simple linear model right here. It's basically saying that the heating load of the building is proportional to the difference between the inside and the outside temperature. And if you have a known internal rate of heat generation, you can subtract that. So you can think of uh, this as the net effect, the net requirement for heat input from the heating system. Uh, the graph here, actually this graph is for a building we're gonna talk about in Boston. It has a design heating load of 75,000 BTUs per hour. So that's our design load point. And that corresponds to an outdoor temperature of nine degrees in that location. So that's just, again, a simple linear model. And then one more model we need. We need to have a relationship between the water temperature that needs to be supplied by the heat pump to the distribution system, to the heat emitters, based on how cold it is outside. And this goes back to a very fundamental idea in hydronics called outdoor reset control. Simply, as it gets warmer outside, the water temperature requirement goes down and vice versa. So in again, this corresponds to this building in Boston. Uh, the distribution system needs 120 degree water at design load conditions, corresponding to that outdoor temperature of nine degrees, and that water temperature goes down as we get warmer and warmer. And this is really important with heat pumps because as we've talked, the heating capacity and the coefficient of performance strongly dependent on outdoor temperature. So if we can lower the water temperature that our hydronic system operates at as it gets warmer outside, we can force that machine into much higher performance as compared to, for example, setting up controls that constantly require the machine to produce 120 degree water. Either one of those control strategies is possible, but the outdoor reset strategy is definitely going to produce better uh, savings, and, and I'll show you that. Okay, so again, how does a specific heat pump, in this case, we're, we're modeling a space pack, uh, what they refer to as a low ambient heat pump. It's a nominal four ton monoblock style um, system. It has uh, the enhanced vapor injection in it. How does it match up with that specific load? So this house in Boston that we set the spreadsheet up around was a 75,000 BTU per hour design load, nine degree outdoor temperature. Uh, as I just mentioned, building hydronic system requires 120 degree water at design load. So here's the capacity uh, graphs. This is again, heat pump BTU per hour output as a function of outdoor temperature and water temperature. And what I did, I just took three points, somewhat arbitrary. I took one point at zero outside, one point at 20, and one point at 40. And we looked at um, what the loads are in the building at that point, and then plotted a graph over here. So the green line, this represents the model that we're using for the simulated heating load. And you can see, again, design conditions correspond to nine degrees outside, 75,000 BTUs per hour, okay? Um, and I plotted those three points. Now these, these points, there's notes on all three of those points, and it shows you that, it shows you what the capacity of the heat pump is based on that specific outdoor temperature and also what water temperature the heat pump, what's the minimum water temperature the heat pump could be supplying that would meet the heating load of the building. And if I just connect those dots, you can see I'm getting a relationship here. 
and basically the orange line would represent my output from the heat pump in BTUs per hour. The green line represents the load, and they cross at about, looks like about 28 degrees outdoor temperature. So the balance point in this particular application, uh, the heat pump can supply all the building's heating requirement down to 28 degree outdoor temperature. Now, what happens when it gets colder? Well, the heat output from the heat pump continues to go down. It is lower than the building load and some other supplemental uh, system is adding uh, that additional heat. So the heat pump doesn't shut off at 28. This heat pump can operate well below zero. It's simply making a lower and lower contribution to the total. And again, we can, we can factor that into our model. Now, uh, again, for a specific case in Boston, when we're dealing with air source heat pumps and we're dealing with performance, we have to know what is the outdoor temperature range and how, how many hours is the outdoor temperature, for example, between five and 10 degrees or between 35 and 40 degrees. So you can get this data. Um, ASHRAE has this data. Some of the uh, uh, manual J's, uh, the ACA manual J's actually have an appendix that has this data. But it's called bin temperature data. As you can see, this first column is nothing more than five degree wide increments of outdoor temperature. The next column is how many hours on a long term statistical basis is the outdoor temperature in Boston within each of these bins. So, for example, between minus five and minus 10, long term average, one hour. In, that's out of the entire year. Now, if it's an especially cold year, you might have two or three hours. If it's a warm year, you might never get down to that temperature. So again, over a long-term average, these are the hours. Uh, this just is the average of these two temperatures here, so between minus five and minus 10. So we're gonna use that as our, our air temperature that the heat pump is operating at. And this represents percent of design load corresponding to that outdoor temperature. So our, remember, our outdoor temperature was uh, nine degrees at design. That represents approximately 100%. Now, the narrower you can make these bins, the more accurate the calculation. I, I believe the ASHRAE data actually takes it right down to bins that are one degree Fahrenheit wide. It just means we have more calculations, but spreadsheets can handle that, no problem. So if we plot that data out, you get something pretty interesting. Uh, this is just a bar graph where we're representing the bins, the temperature bins along the bottom, and then the number of hours in those bins as the vertical height of the bar. And you can see under these very low temperatures, it's, there's very little time in a, in a typical year. There's very little time when we're uh, even at zero, much less below zero. But as we get up into these more moderate temperatures, let's say from 25 degrees up through 45, you can see we spent a lot of hours up in this temperature range, okay? And that's good news from the standpoint of heat pump performance. It, it simply is showing you that the heat pump in this particular location is going to be operating many more hours in the, let's say, let's pick a bin, 30 to 35 degree range compared to when it's in the five to 10 degree range, okay? So the more hours we have under those moderate temperatures, the, the higher our capacity is, which means less runtime, and also the higher the coefficient of performance is going to be. Now, this next graph, this is another way of looking at that bin temperature data, another way to think of it. What it, it is, it's called a heating duration curve, and you're plotting the percent of the design load on the vertical axis or you can also plot directly BTUs per hour of the design load. Okay, so it could be a percent. I left it as a percent just so it would apply to, in theory, any building, okay? And, and on the horizontal axis, you're showing the hours during which the space heating load is greater than or equal to a given percent of design load, okay? Now, so we have hours as our units on the horizontal axis, on the vertical axis, if we were to put BTUs per hour, okay, as opposed to a percent of load. Let's just say, let's say that the 100 here instead of percent represents 100,000 100, BTUs per hour, okay? 
Well, the area under that curve, that yellow shaded area, is proportional to the total space heating energy requirement of the building. Now, it doesn't factor in passive solar gains. It doesn't factor in other types of internal gains that could affect it. But simply based on the model that heating load is proportional to the inside outside temperature difference, that yellow area represents uh, the total space heating energy use over the entire heating season. Okay. Now, what I did here, and again, these graphs are in Hydronics 27, so you can read about them in, in perhaps a little more detail. We took that previous graph and I scaled it so that the design load here lines up exactly with the design load on this graph, okay? And then I drew a line from the balance point across, and you can see the green area down here which is about 94% of the total area. If we, if we said this yellow area here is 100%, that green area is, in this case, 94.2%. That represents the percentage of the total space heating energy that could be supplied by the heat pump uh, at, uh, at the, I don't wanna say this, uh, without going into a condition where the heat pump's output is insufficient to heat the building. In other words, at the balance point or outdoor temperatures above the balance point, about 94% of the total space heating energy occurs above the balance point, okay? And then surprises some people, all right? The capacity of this heat pump is, is not 75,000 BTUs per hour. Um, again, its capacity is a strong function of outdoor temperature, but let's say in, in nominal terms, it's about a four ton heat pump. So it's around 48,000, 50,000 BTUs per hour nominal. And you might say, well, why would anybody put a 50,000 BTU per hour heat pump into a building with a design load of 75,000 BTUs per hour? That's grossly undersized. Well, yes, for a boiler, it, it probably is, but because of the combination of the outdoor temperature ranges we're working with and how that affects the performance of the heat pump, we're still looking at a situation where that heat pump is supplying the vast majority of the total space heating energy. And that's one of the nice things about plotting a heating duration curve. We could say, uh, uh, we could look at other um, interpretations of that heating curve. If we size the heat source for, for example, half of the design load, how much of the total space heating energy could a heat source size for half of the design load provide? It's definitely more than half of the total space heating energy. And again, the underlying reason is in most climates, we spend a lot of time, not at design load conditions, but substantially warmer, okay? Now, putting all this together, we built a spreadsheet. I'm gonna show you the spreadsheet. And uh, if you're like me, my typical reaction when somebody brings out a spreadsheet is the person that created it is very, very proud of the spreadsheet, as I am, okay? But the person looking at it for the first time says, what in the world? Look at all these numbers. How am I gonna understand what's going on? What are the purple numbers? What are the yellow numbers? So forth. Bottom line, we're mixing all those graphs that we looked at. We're, we're mixing the mo mathematical model for the heating capacity, coefficient of performance, the building load, and the uh, supply water temperature. Those are all being factored in along with climate data, in this case for Boston. So over here, you'll see our bin temperatures, our average temperature in a number of hours. And underlying these cells in the spreadsheet are those formulas. So we're basically just doing a lot of calculations that, yeah, we could do by hand if we had a week, but we're doing it uh, almost instantaneously by building the spreadsheet. Now, you wanna be careful when you do models because remember these, uh, these polynomial functions, uh, they're continuous functions. And when you get into the far regions of your operating range, sometimes they can uh, grossly over predict or under predict what's happening. So what I did just to try to keep this thing realistic, I limited the COP to no higher than 4.5. You can see over here, this is where the COP, the heat pump's being calculated, and it doesn't go above 4.5. Now, I'm estimating that. 
um, the manufacturer might be able to refine that a little bit better, but 4.5 is a pretty good COP on, on any heat pump. I'm also limiting the output to 68,000 BTUs per hour. In theory, those capacity curves would go higher. So we're, you can see over here, we're limiting at 68,000. Uh, again, a quick reminder, the heat emitters need 120 at supply, uh, our supply water temperature at design load. And uh, the supply water temperature to the heat emitter here is being reduced based on outdoor reset. So we're taking advantage of that condition where the outdoor temperatures are moderating and we're lowering the water temperature that that heat pump is operating at. We're still maintaining comfort in the building, but we're not forcing the heat pump up into conditions that are unnecessary given the outdoor temperature to maintain comfort. And the bottom line is this, two things. Um, our seasonal average COP, where we look at the COP within each temperature range and the number of hours, we multiply those together, add it all up, and then divide by the total number of hours. So it's a time-weighted average COP, uh, 3.2. That's actually a pretty good figure. And it compares favorably to what some geothermal systems would produce in a similar climate with a similar water temperature requirement and so forth. Uh, it also is telling me that I'm getting just about 98% of the total space heating energy being supplied by the heat pump. Uh, you'll see there is an auxiliary energy requirement being calculated here under these really low ambient temperatures. Uh, the spreadsheet doesn't really you know, determine what supplies that supplemental energy, but it, it can calculate it by taking the load and subtracting what the output of the heat pump is. And this particular heat pump that was modeled here, this is a split system. Uh, it's a space pack product. This is the model number on it. I believe it is on the market, it's available now. Uh, there's the outdoor unit. You can see the refrigerant line sets and they come in and here's the indoor unit. So we got some pretty good performance on that simulation. And we actually looked at this and we compared the price of energy being supplied through this heat pump to the price of natural gas. We actually found that the heat pump was producing energy at a lower cost in, in dollars per million BTUs supplied than gas was in that market. And that's significant because oftentimes today when we look at alternatives to natural gas, sometimes we, some of us throw our hands up and say, well, they've got natural gas service. You know, we can't compete with that, with anything else, whether it's fuel oil or pellets or solar, thermal, whatever. Uh, not the case here. And I believe in that area where this model was uh, produced, uh, electricity was running about, I think it was 14.7 cents per kilowatt hour. I, I honestly don't remember what the gas price was, but um, very competitive situation here. Okay, now I ran another one. Um, if earlier this year, if you uh, tuned in on some of the uh, uh, mini series that we did, uh, I talked about a project that was involved with pretty extensively last summer with my daughter building a new house. And we actually put this uh, space pack uh, unit in. So uh, I, just took the spreadsheet and I modified it a little bit. How's this house gonna perform with that same heat pump? Well, this house has a, a significantly lower load, design load of 36,000 BTUs per hour at a minus 10 outside temperature. And the spreadsheet you're looking at here, you'll see I kept the water temperature all at 105 degrees because the controls were set up. Basically the buffer tank temperature was what turned the heat pump on and off. And the way it was, still is, configured, when the buffer tank dropped to 100 degrees, the heat pump turned on. When it got up to 110, the heat pump shut off. So our average temperature that the heat pump was operating at was 105. And again, we limited COP to 4.5. We limited capacity to 68,000. And we're getting a seasonal uh, weighted average coefficient of performance, 2.75, a little lower. Well you might say, how come this is lower than that Boston project? Well, because look at what we're doing with water temperature. We're maintaining it in this particular model at 105. And I'm sure most of you are thinking, well, what if we lowered that water temperature? All right, well, I'm gonna lower it just five degrees. 
really simple. Instead of 105 in this column, it's going to be 100. Imagine we could turn the heat pump on at 95, turn it off at 105. Look at what our COP does. It goes from 2.7 to 2.9. That's only a five degree drop in the water temperature. We're still not taking advantage of outdoor reset. The reason we did that in this particular system is that we're using that water in the buffer tank to provide most of the heating for domestic water. Doesn't provide 100%, but we're using that temperature in that range 105, 110 to get most of the temperature lift for domestic water. Is that the optimal way to do this? I, I can't answer that yet. I've got to extend this, the spreadsheet and, and actually model that. In other words, are you better off to use outdoor reset control and have less pre preheating effect on domestic water or as we have it set up right now? Uh, I wanna show you what happens though if we go to a full outdoor reset on this scenario. If I calculate what this temperature is based on outdoor reset, we jump up to about 3.4 on our seasonal average COP. And again, that's a really good performance number. It compares uh, favorably with what a geothermal system. Uh, yes, geothermal heat pumps can provide higher COPs under certain conditions than air source. Uh, you really can't just take a snapshot of either heat pump and say, all right, here's a snapshot of performance of the air source heat pump. Here's a snapshot on the geo. Uh, the geo has a higher number, end of story. That's, it's not the end of story. What really counts when you're looking at these systems is not, bottom line, is not that COP. If you look at your utility bill, you will not see a line on there that charges you for COP. You will see a line that has kilowatt hours. So it really comes down to how many kilowatt hours does a given approach save you? That's what you're paying for. So don't judge the performance of a system strictly based on COPs. There's, there's a, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of people do that. And, you know, I, I understand uh, when you have a product that has the capability of having high COP under right conditions, you probably want to promote that. But remember, this is a whole spectrum of performance, both with, a, uh, with the air source heat pump as well as with a, with a geo. Okay. Okay, now I also put down here some uh, uh, prices and back in the spring of this year, uh, in our area, we were paying about 223 per gallon for fuel oil. And if that was run through a standard uh, cast iron sectional boiler, uh, about 18 and a half dollars per million BTUs. Propane's expensive in the Northeast, at least in, in the uh, upstate New York, uh, about $2, about two and a half dollars per gallon, pretty expensive, almost, uh, well, $29 per million BTUs. But our electricity prices uh, at about nine, roughly nine cents per kilowatt hour, at that lower COP, that would be if we're maintaining the buffer tank at that higher temperature range, we're down at about $9.66. So we're on the order of half the price of fuel oil for the energy coming from this air source heat pump. And if we went to a full outdoor reset scenario where we where we average 3.47 on our COP, you can see we're down around a little under $8. So again, I'm, I'm looking at what the utility costs are and comparing it to what the simulated, and I would say a reasonably accurate simulation of the heat pump and the building uh, would be. And uh, we're seeing uh, very competitive um, operating costs in relationship to other fuels, okay. So let's, uh, let's pause here, we're gonna do another poll question. Do you plan to use or do you currently use chill water cooling in combination with either an air to water heat pump or if you're doing geothermal, perhaps a water to water heat pump? Are you doing this chill water cooling, taking advantage of the heat pump? So we'll watch these numbers come in. Yep, they're rolling in. They jumped out really strong in the beginning. Now they're starting to get pretty close to one another. I would say this is probably more commercial than residential, don't you think, Siggy? Currently, anyways. Uh, yeah, it would be. Uh, although I do think opportunity is going to show up more in the, the residential light commercial sector. Yeah. Well, okay. another interesting number. 51% yes, 49% no. <laughs> yeah, it's, 
it's like the voting electorate in the U.S. right now, right? It could flip either way, I guess. But um, well, again, that's encouraging. And again, folks, think about as the market progresses, whether it's more geothermal water to water systems or air to water heat pumps, both are going to take a segment of the market where we have the opportunity to add cooling. And, you know, looking back over working in hydronics for 40 years, cooling has always been that kind of that missing element. When you're talking to a potential client and they're excited about floor heating and, and so forth, and, and then the question comes up, well, what do I do about cooling? And, you know, you kind of shrug your shoulders and say, well, we can do a separate AC system or I can recommend another contractor who could do that for you. Uh, or we could do ductless mini splits, but there's no um, uh, there's no easy solution for cooling when you're using a boiler. It, it's pretty much a separate system. Well, with a heat pump, you have the ability to provide that cooling. You just need to make sure, obviously, that your distribution system, your heat emit, well, your I call them uh, chill water terminal units. Uh, you have to have a way to to get that. 45 50 degree water through the building do cooling and dehumidification and not make a mess with condensation that's the kind of the bottom line so let me uh just move this control panel here and then we're going to go back so let's talk about low temperature uh distribution systems we are going to jump into cooling here but uh when you're dealing with heat pumps and again this applies to geo water to water as well as these air to water the lower the supply temperature the better I oftentimes uh, suggest nothing higher than 120 degree water at design load. Uh, it's not a standard, you won't find it in an ASHRAE handbook, but it is a practical number. Uh, and obviously it's a good number if you're using a ModCon boiler, or if you're perhaps today, maybe a building's going with a, a boiler with the idea that five years from now, 10 years from now, maybe a heat pump will be the replacement for that boiler. So I want to design the distribution system to at least be compatible with what that future heat source might be. So um, I'd like the idea, especially if you're dealing with buildings that have low loads, you want to have low thermal mass for relatively rapid response. If, if you've got a building with a lot of solar gain or potential for a lot of internal heat gain, a high mass system is going to work against you. You're going to overshoot and undershoot. Okay, now uh, th there's many examples of low temperature emitters. It could be a radiant ceiling, it could be a radiant wall. There are some radiant floor panels that are much lower thermal mass compared to a slab. Okay, um, I also like room by room zone control. It's one of the um, distinct advantages or benefits of hydronics. It's very easy to do that. Uh, if you are doing floor heating, you really want to stay away from large area rugs or carpet and padding that, that obviously that forces that water temperature up and penalizes the, the performance of the heat pump. Okay, if you're doing fan coils for heating, um, be careful. You don't want to do a deep reset on that water temperature because you're going to get complaints about uh, cool air blowing out of the registers. So uh, uh, supply air temperatures lower than about 100 degrees Fahrenheit and not well diffused into the room are going to potentially cause those complaints. So bottom line, uh, low temperature, low mass, hydronic distribution systems are a good match. And again, in Hydronics 27, we go into uh, more detail, but I just wanted to give you kind of a collage of what's possible here. I do show a, a high mass slab system. Now, there's going to be applications, for example, a, a service garage or a workshop or um, even something like an aircraft hangar, or, you know, uh, any type of a commercial slab on grade building with a relatively stable heating load uh, with floor heating in a slab could be supplied from either a single air to water heat pump or if you get up into capacity ranges, uh, perhaps multiple air to water heat pumps. Uh, you want to keep the R value of any covering here. My suggestion, nothing higher than an R1 over the top of that slab. Um, a bare slab or a stained slab, painted slab, ideal. Uh, if we get into underfloor tube and plate systems, uh, nothing wider than eight inch tube spacing, uh, five inch or six inch wide plates. 
And there's a graph here. And again, in Hydronix 27, it gets into this more. But it basically is showing you a performance model for this configuration based on what the R value of the floor coverings are. Okay. And the higher that R value is, the lower the performance, the lower the output is going to be. Uh, this is a radiant ceiling system that we've uh, talked about in several past issues of Hydronics. Uh, with uh, PEX aluminum PEX tubing and again five inch aluminum plates and drywall underneath. This is a radiant wall. It's the same construction as the ceiling, just turned 90 degrees. And then uh, again, some of my favorites panel rads. Uh, this is a Meissen panel radiator, and you see it's got a thermostatic valve on it that allows room by room uh, control. In one of the latest technologies, and we're going to see more of this uh, over the next five years in North America, uh, is a fan-assisted panel radiator. This, these radiators use very small fans, like the fan in your desktop computer. And those fans enhance the convection in that radiator under low water temperatures. They give a significant boost in heat output when we're dealing with water, let's say in the range of 90, 9,500 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, these products were developed to basically enable heat pumps in primarily in the European market to be the heat source of the future and uh, to make sure that these radiators are compatible with these lower water temperatures. Now, uh, of course, residential hydronic systems, most of them include domestic water heating. So how can you do this with an air to water heat pump? Okay. Well, one approach is to use a D superheater. Now, many geothermal heat pumps have this, whether it's a geothermal water to air heat pump or a geothermal water to water, what a D superheater is, is an extra heat exchanger that takes the hottest gas coming off the compressor before that gas gets to the reversing valve. And it, it passes through the primary side of a heat exchanger. And then the secondary side of the heat exchanger has water from the bottom of the thermal storage tank, uh, let's say the electric uh, water heater, that cooler water uh, goes through a small stainless steel circulator, goes through the heat exchanger, gets heated, and then it goes back into the dip tube in the water heater. So what we're doing here is we're scavenging heat from the refrigerant and putting it into the domestic water tank. Now, during cooling mode operation, this is essentially free domestic water heating because that energy would otherwise be going outside and just dissipated through the outdoor unit. Uh, in a geothermal system, same thing, it'd be dissipated into the ground. So, so in cooling, we're really getting a nice free benefit of domestic water heating. And even in heating mode, we're still getting a benefit here. We're taking, the, we still have to take that refrigerant gas coming off that compressor and we have to lower its temperature to the point where it will start to condense. That's what de-superheating means. So we're scavenging about nominal numbers, about 10% of the capacity of the heat pump and putting that in the domestic water tank. Now, some air to water heat pump systems are available today with this. Uh, Nordic is one example. Uh, here's the outdoor unit. Here's the indoor unit. Uh, the two larger pipes you see here, these are the main output of the heat pump going to space heating. Um, uh, the refrigerant line set connects here on these service valves that, that hasn't been installed yet, but you'll see a couple small pipes up here. Those are uh, probably either half inch, maybe three quarter inch tubes that go off to the domestic water. That's a de-superheater. And of course, this is the indoor unit, so we don't have to be concerned about it freezing on the inside. Uh, some of the heat pump Installers prefer to go to two tanks on a D superheater. This is something that's kind of evolved in the geothermal heat pump market. The idea is that the preheat tank would stay at a lower temperature and allow more BTUs to be captured from the D superheater. And then as hot water is drawn at the fixtures, okay, that preheated water goes in and gets a final boost from the elements in the tank. Uh, I'm not sure if there actually is any uh, research that's been published on this, what the performance gain would be. In theory, yes, you'd get more BTUs because the preheat tank would allow the um, water going into the DE superheater to be at a lower temperature and, and hence better heat transfer. Is it worth the price of the extra tank plus the 
higher standby losses, that would all have to be factored in. But it is uh, an option, I wanted to show it, that is, uh, again, sometimes used in the geo market and really is just as applicable to a D superheater on an air to water heat pump. Uh, here's another option, and that's a, an indirect tank. And the thing I really wanna stress here is don't use an indirect that has a small coil in it. Um, many of the indirect tanks that are on the market in North America, they were built around the idea of a boiler supplying the heat. And if you look at the ratings, they're often rated at two heat source input temperatures to the coil. One is 180 Fahrenheit, the other is 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, you're not gonna get anywhere near those temperatures with, with these heat pumps. So if you connect a heat pump to a very small coil in an indirect, the heat pump's gonna short cycle. It's basically gonna, the water temperature is going to climb very quickly because the coil can't dissipate the heat into the domestic water as fast as the heat pump is producing the heat. So you've got that imbalance and the heat pump's gonna just short cycle, it's gonna shut off. And uh, you know, that just, you're never gonna be able to have good steady state operation. So uh, if you go to this approach, get a tank that has a lot, the largest internal coils possible. I show an example of one tank over there. There are some tanks on the market now that have dual coils, uh, probably connect them both in series. Uh, so that you, you know, you're taking advantage of the higher surface area of that internal coil. Now, um, up above here, we just have a diverter valve. So basically the diverter valve, when, when the system calls for domestic water heating with some kind of a temperature set point control, the diverter valve would direct the flow coming off the heat pump condenser into the coil in the indirect tank. And uh, the buffer tank just sits there. Um, there could be energy in the buffer tank that could simultaneously be going out to the load, but obviously as that, if the load is taking heat from the buffer tank, the temperature is gonna go down. And as soon as we satisfy the domestic tank, we're gonna go back and uh, bring the tank, a uh, buffer tank temperature back up again. So basically we have a prioritized domestic hot water scenario here from controls. We can't send heat to both simultaneously, at least with this setup. You know, you could get into more elaborate setups and more elaborate controls, but this is this is pretty basic. Um, I'm also showing an electric tankless water heater. Uh, the requirement here, let's say that we're looking for 140 degree water, and we're you know we're concerned about Legionella. We want to get that water temperature up, or we need higher water temperature for sterilization. You know, perhaps in a healthcare facility. Uh, something like that. Uh, well, we aren't gonna get 140 degree water coming out of this tank, regardless of how big this coil is. So we need some kind of a boost there. It could be an electric tankless water heater. Uh, today, most of those have thermostatic control so that um, they will operate the wattage of the element as necessary to bring that preheated water up to a final delivery temperature, okay? You could also use a tank type water heater and simply think of the indirect as your preheating system, okay? Now, another option is a reverse indirect. Uh, there aren't as many reverse indirects currently on the North American market, but there are some. Uh, one example is a TurboMax tank. They've been around for quite a while. And if you're not familiar with it, basically it's a steel carbon steel tank with an insulated jacket. And inside there are several copper coils. If you look at that, you'll see, wow, there's a lot of copper in that. It's a lot of surface area. And that's good. High surface area means minimal delta T between the fluid that is contributing the heat to the domestic water and, and the domestic water temperature. So one nice thing about an indirect I'm sorry, about reverse indirect, is that one tank can serve as both the buffering for the uh, zone space heating loads, and also as either, um, well, depending on temperature, it could fully heat domestic hot water, or it could be viewed as a preheat with an electric um, tankless water heater as a final boost. And again, I'm, I'm showing the electric tankless water heater uh, if your requirement for domestic water is 110 degree water, 105 degree water, 
that's all within the capability of what that heat pump can do. But remember, if you're using outdoor reset control to try to optimize that coefficient of performance on based on space heating, the warmer it gets outside, the less preheating you're going to have and the more that supplemental uh, water heater is going to have to come into play, okay? Um, we're also showing here one of the things you don't want to do with, with any heat exchanger, and certainly this applies to the condenser in a air to water, you don't want to have any debris going into that heat exchanger. So a good dirt separator, uh, a magnetic equipped uh, dirt separator is, is good, especially if you're using high efficiency brushless DC circulators in the system. We want to capture any oxides, iron oxides, and uh, get those out of the system before they go in, potentially scale out on that heat exchanger. So one more option here. Uh, you'll see this more in Europe, although this tank that I'm showing you here from Therm Atlantic is, uh, is available in North America. This is a tank in tank configuration. Uh, we have a buffer tank, which is the outer tank here, and suspended within that, in this case, it's a 40-gallon um, a stainless steel inner tank. And you see the idea here is that your cold domestic water just goes into that tank, and that, that inner 40-gallon tank is suspended in and completely surrounded by heated water. So it's going to have heat transfer through the walls. And again, depending on the, the, the flow rate of domestic hot water, the dwell time in this tank, the uh, temperature of the outer tank, you either are preheating or perhaps fully heating. So again, I'm showing it going out to a tankless electric water heater as a boost, okay? And then a uh, anti-scald valve in here, especially if you're going up to 140, 150 for sterilization reasons, uh, you don't wanna send that temperature off to the fixtures. So you can see there's quite a few different options here for incorporating domestic water heating into the system, okay? One more, uh, we actually did this in my daughter's house. This is an on-demand external heat exchanger with a flow switch. So here we've got a five by 12 uh, plate size heat exchanger, 40 plates deep, and another uh, portion, well, let me explain this one. Uh, this pipe coming down, this is hot water from the top of the buffer tank coming into the primary side, and then it comes out, goes down through the circulator, and right back into the lower tank header, back into the tank. Uh, the other side has the cold water coming in, and it goes in counter flow, and it gets a preheat effect through there. And what turns the circulator on is this little flow switch. We actually wired that flow switch, which detects anytime. Uh, domestic hot water demand uh, gets up to or above 0 0.7 gallons per minute. And it's a little reed switch. So we've wired this over to a zone control panel and that, that output on the zone control panel turns on the circulator. And so whenever there is a demand of 0 0.7 GPM or higher, open a faucet, turn on a shower, fill a bathtub, whatever it is, we're getting a preheating effect. We're basically taking hot water from the buffer tank sending it through the primary side and then picking up that heat. And again, we, we can boost it. Uh, we could boost it with a tankless water heater or I, I just wanna show another option, a small uh, electric water heater. Uh, in my daughter's house, we use the 38 gallon water heater with a, a 4.5 kW element in it. And that element is actually large enough that if the heat pump was out of service for any reason, uh, you still have a 4.5 kW heating element uh, to supply the domestic water load. Uh, again, if you're sizing that heat exchanger, the biggest heat exchanger you can afford might be a good rule of thumb. Uh, you're trying to keep that approach temperature difference no higher than five degrees. Uh, the lower you can keep it, the more preheating effect you're going to get. So again, there's um, four or five different ways to incorporate domestic hot water. Now let's briefly, let's talk about chill water cooling. Uh, performance of the heat pump on chill water cooling, uh, bottom line, the colder you want the water, the lower the performance of the heat pump. It's just the opposite of heating performance. So if we can operate our cooling system with, let's say, 55 degree chill water versus 45 degree chill water, a substantial difference in cooling capacity. 
And we also get a substantial difference in energy efficiency ratio, the, in effect, the cooling equivalent of uh, COP. Now, we do want to make sure that we size our coil so we get adequate latent cooling. We've got to make sure we get the moisture removal capability of whatever we're sending this chill water to such that it can maintain a reasonable relative humidity. A, a typical target's about 50% uh, RH at a 75 degree uh, dry bulb indoor temperature. So uh, again, a larger coil is going to benefit from the standpoint of uh, keeping the chill water temperature elevated a little bit and thus allowing the heat pump to operate at uh, higher capacity and also higher energy efficiency ratio. Uh, you've got choices for indoor. Uh, Meissen makes a nice unit here and, and some other companies do as well. Make sure you have a drip pan. Don't just assume that any console or any air handler can work with chill water. That, that coil is going to get wet and on a hot, humid day, you're going to produce several gallons of condensate. And uh, if you don't have a drip pan, it's going to be a, a real mess. So make sure you have a drip pan in it. Uh, here's a high wall air handler. Uh, it's virtually identical in appearance and concept to a ductless mini split. The difference is it's a water coil versus a refrigerant coil. Uh, it, it turns on with a remote. Uh, the uh, louvers down here oscillate up and down just like with a ductless mini split. You're just using chill water. Um, here's a central air handler. Uh, this is, again, in my daughter's house. This is a three-ton rated air handler. Uh, some of these today come so that you can configure them for either horizontal or vertical mounting. You just change the orientation of the A-coil that's in there. Uh, very important, make sure your line set, your chill water pipes back to the mechanical room are insulated and vapor sealed. Now, we could have done this with copper. Uh, we could have bought packs and slid pieces of insulation onto it. We elected to just go with pre-insulated three-quarter inch uh, barrier packs. Uh, this happened to be from Upanor. There, there may be other sources of it out there. Uh, it ran about $2 a foot. It's, I think it's well worth it. We could route this up from the basement mechanical room to the second floor where this air handler is very easily relative to putting sticks of copper in and, and trying to slide all that insulation. Uh, I can't overstress how important it is to do a good job with that insulation. If you're new to chill water cooling, you can't get sloppy with the insulation. The joints have to be glued. The seams have to stay together. You have to pay attention to the details. If humid air can get to a surface that's below the dew point, and on a hot, humid day, that dew point could be up in the lower 70s. Um, you're going to get condensation. And if that piping goes over a drywall ceiling, you're going to see uh, streaks on that ceiling. So if you want to get involved with chill water cooling, make sure you come up with a good insulation system. And a typical um, elastomeric foam is, is commonly used. OK, uh, here's a piping detail. Uh, this actually, these are some pipe support brackets for copper tubing that um, allow the insulation to basically slide right into the center point. They support the weight of the pipe, and you can see that's on a, a strut channel right here, but allows you to slide the insulation in from both sides. And it's just a very small little, uh, it's probably less than an eighth of an inch thick uh, polymer wall where these uh, two ends of the insulation will meet. So you get good mechanical support. And if you caulk that detail, we haven't shown it here, but if you caulk that up with some silicone, you're basically going to keep any air away from that joint. Uh, if you're insulating piping with zone valves or circulators, um, you want to insulate the zone valve body, but not the actuator. Okay, we don't want the uh, actuator to be insulated. It would get cold potentially. It could get some condensation in it. If it's operating in the heating mode too, it could potentially overheat. Same thing with a circulator volume. Now, just to show you, this is a cast iron circulator, and it, it, this would happen with pretty much any brand that I've had any experience with. After a few weeks of chill water operation, you're getting surface oxidation that looks pretty bad. Now, this, this corrosion isn't eating through the cast iron and eventually causing a failure, but it looks terrible, and it's going to drip on the floor and anything below it. And you can see it extends up onto the flange bolts, even though those are zinc-plated bolts. 
it doesn't take long. So uh, I know Grunfuss, for one, uh, there may be others, but uh, has an insulated shell for, in, in this case, the alpha circulator. When you put that together, seal all the joints up with some silicone. The, the key idea is you don't want air that contains moisture to get to any surface that's below the dew point. So don't just push them together and say, I'm done. Seal it up good. Okay. Uh, in Hydronics 27, there's a chart that gives you an idea of how much R value or thickness, wall thickness you need with uh, elastomeric foam insulation, depending on what your operating conditions are. In general, it doesn't have to be a lot, a quarter inch, three eighths of an inch, half inch is very, very adequate um, if your goal is simply to stop condensation. Okay. Um, and you know, again, we've talked about this. I, I want to stress if we've got some circulator manufacturers looking at the webinar today, guys, we need some products that do chill water in small circulators. We need circulators compatible with uh, those low water temperatures, and we need to have some kind of a good solution for insulating those volutes. We're going to see more applications, whether it's in the air to water heat pump market or the geo water to water market where those circulators are going to be in conditions that will produce this kind of surface corrosion. So we need, we need a good solution. So that's my, my plea to the circulator manufacturers today. Okay, we've got a few minutes left. I'll run you through some details. Uh, it's important, especially in Northern climates to get that condenser unit, that outdoor unit up off the ground. Whether you do it like this, in this case, they put in six inch diameter Sono tubes, fill them up with concrete and they bolted that down. Uh, certainly if you're in an area that has high wind speeds, you don't want this thing bouncing around outside when you get a storm coming through. Uh, here's a single pressure treated uh, pedestal that supports that unit. Uh, here's a couple units uh, that actually has an alcove. This was new construction. So they built an alcove here and you can see both units are, are running in parallel. They're a few inches up in this area where the snow cover uh, doesn't get above them. It is important you get airspace behind these units. Don't push these units right up against the wall. Most of the uh, manufacturers want to see at least a foot, sometimes maybe a foot and a half behind the unit to make sure that you aren't restricting airflow that is basically from back to front on these units. Uh, in some small capacity equipment, you might be able to use wall brackets to mount the uh, unit like this. Um, here is actually the unit in my office, and I try to get a, a good snapshot to show you how fast that condensate comes off during a defrost cycle. When that outdoor coil frosts up, the unit will go into a defrost, and you're probably producing at least a quart and a half of water, and it's going to drop off of that coil. Now, if that's sitting on a slab at grade, it's going to freeze. And eventually you're gonna create an ice bathtub around the bottom of that unit. And the, it, you know, the more the, the bathtub grows, the less condensate is gonna drain and you can damage the coil. You can freeze, uh, the ice can cause damage. And actually I know of one case where a, um, it was a ductless mini split, but it's the same argument. Uh, they actually split the refrigeration piping due to ice buildup at the bottom. So get the unit up. Uh, there are some kits available on the market today. This gets the unit up about 14, 15 inches. Uh, we put some landscape fabric and some crushed stone down just so we didn't have grass growing up under, under a unit. So get it up above grade, okay? Um, piping details. I'd like to use either a flexible hose connection like this. Uh, this installation used a corrugated stainless steel tube. But what we're trying to do is put some curvature in a flexible tube so that we're reducing any vibration from the outdoor unit transferring to the piping inside. Um, I, my experience has been that the, the scroll compressor units that use inverter speed control are much quieter than the on-off units. Uh, but in either case, a good anti-vibration detail is, is good. Um, this is how we put the piping through the wall. This is one inch copper. That's a two inch PVC sleeve. Basically, we took a quarter inch pilot drill, went right through the wall so we stayed straight. Uh, hole saw, put 
put the uh, PVC in, we put some, we wrapped it with um, electrical tape. So we have a nice tight seal there, could kind of friction fit it in, uh, pass the pipe through it, and then eventually foamed it. Just took a hacksaw blade, trimmed the foam off, and put the insulation. Uh, this doesn't show it yet, but this should be wrapped with a, a UV resistant tape so that you don't get degradation uh, over time of that foam. Buffer tank options. Um, again, in Hydronics 27, we get into it in more detail. There's different ways to pipe the buffer tank. I'm gonna jump right to the bottom line here. I like the three pipe configuration. That would be this one over here. It allows what's called direct to load heat transfer. So if the heat pump is operating at the same time as the load, we can potentially send that flow directly to the load without having to first warm up the buffer tank. But it also routes the return flow back through the buffer tank. So we do engage the thermal mass of the buffer tank, at least on the cool side. Um, this can do similar things. If you're using a two pipe, you need some kind of a way to prevent flow that's coming back from the load. You don't want that flow to go up through the heat pump when it's off. It just dissipates heat into the mechanical room. Um, it doesn't hurt the heat pump per se, but it's a undesirable condition. So we found that putting a differential pressure bypass valve at its lowest setting, about one PSI, that provides enough forward opening resistance to uh, prevent that. We have not found that the check valve that is in some of the small circulators, those check valves open at about a third to a half of a PSI. Depending on what the resistance of this path is right here, including the header and the T's, uh, bottom and top, that might not be enough forward opening resistance. So here's an example. This is right out of Hydronics 27. Uh, split system, air water heat pump supplying a buffer tank. We're coming off of that. Uh, it's a three pipe configuration. We're going to a manifold and we have got a combination of panel radiators, a towel warmer, some floor circuits. Do whatever you'd like, keep the water temperature low and zone to your heart's content because that buffer tank is your, uh, your friend keeping that heat pump from short cycling. Okay. Supplemental heat, we can use an electric boiler just in parallel with the heat pump. Make sure you have check valves so you don't get reverse flow and purging valves. Okay. Uh, the, you could use a two-stage control where the heat pump is the lead stage and then the auxiliary boiler, the electric boiler, tops it off when necessary. And of course, if you size that electric boiler, uh, you could size it to do a full design load. So if the heat pump is out of service for some reason, uh, the electric boiler simply takes over. Uh, fossil fuel boilers. I think these are possible retrofit details. Uh, you probably aren't gonna find today with where trends are, where people are going to elect to go with an electric heat pump and also put in, let's say a propane boiler, because again, the, the carbon footprint. Um, so in a retrofit situation, if there's an existing mod con, it can be piped just like the electric boiler. If it's a, cast iron boiler or copper tube uh, boiler, uh, I would recommend that you put in a uh, thermal protection valve so that you don't cause flue gas condensation in that boiler. Remember, you've designed the balance of that system now to operate at low water temperatures. You could potentially have a situation where that boiler for 15 years is operated on baseboard, operated at high temperatures, no problem with flue gas condensation. All of a sudden, you're You've re-engineered or reconfigured the system for much lower water temperature. Make sure you protect the boiler. And again, those valves are, are valuable to do that. Um, you can get buffer tanks with built-in electric elements from different manufacturers. This is essentially just putting the elements in the tank instead of uh, hooking up an electric boiler. Okay. And another option, at least one manufacturer of air-to-water systems today, uh, actually builds in I believe there are two 6KW elements. So that's a 12KW 12, um, 12 uh, auxiliary that's built right into the heat pump and the controls to operate those are integrated right into the heat pump. So essentially there's no requirement for elements in the tank or a separate auxiliary boiler, okay? Again, all these drawings, I'm, I'm going kind of fast, all these drawings are in Hydronics 27. So we're almost done. Uh, we are gonna take some questions at the end, but one final poll question here. 
do you use buffer tanks and systems with either air to water or water to water heat pumps? Uh, do you always do it, sometimes do it, or never do it? Where that goes. A good point from Colin Wonder. You know, Colin, our friend, the High Plains Drifter out there. He said 93% of the systems he puts in in residential are using uh, the cooling function. So yeah, that's interesting to know. Great. Great. All right, see what we've got here. That looks like always is going to win by quite a bit. 54% for always, 38 for sometimes, 8 for never. Yeah. Um, and, and I should point out, you know, you might say the people that are never doing it are, are headed for problems. Well, heat pump technology, as we get into inverter compressors, as long as you are creating a distribution system that doesn't have a load smaller than the, the minimum capacity in either heating or cooling of the heat pump, yeah, you can do it without a buffer tank. You still want hydraulic separation between the heat pump and the, the balance of the system. But as long as you can match the load with the output of the heat pump, we've, we've got the balance we need. Uh, once you start to get into uh, what we call micro zoning or micro loading, if, if for example, you tell me I want a panel radiator in each room or a separate radiant ceiling panel in each room with you know TRVs on it or thermostats, I'm gonna tell you to put a buffer tank in regardless of the heat pump because uh, you're, you're easily creating loads that are a small fraction of even the lowest capacity of a, a modulating heat pump. Okay, let me just move that and we will go on. Uh, real quick, if you want to monitor heat pump performance, the hardware is out there. Uh, you can use one of the uh, Kalefi Kanteka heat meters, just install it. We're getting the delta T across the heat pump and the flow rate. And uh, back in, I uh, forgot which hydronics it is, I think 24, 25, we talked about heat metering, uh, all the details. So that's giving you the total BTUs that the heat pump's delivering. And then for about $100, you can get one of these little meters. Uh, basically, you just run um, your 240 volt supply to the heat pump through it. And that gives you kilowatt hours. So if you want the COP, I'll say the average COP over any period of time, we just take the total BTUs that the meter, the Conteca meter gives us, divide it by the kilowatt hours that this meter gives us, and we convert kilowatt hours over to BTUs by multiplying with that factor. So it's pretty easy to, um, to put a heat meter in and uh, monitor the performance of that heat pump. Uh, real quick, system examples. Uh, I mentioned, uh, Workshops, um, as an example, a service garage, you don't have to be elaborate. Very simple. It's a single mass, or I'm sorry, single zone, high mass radiant slab supplied through a hydraulic separator, supplied by, in this case, a monoblock heat pump. We're putting antifreeze in the whole system. Uh, putting the hydraulic separator gives us all our air, dirt, magnetic particle separation. It separates the uh, pressure dynamics of the heat pump circulator from the distribution circulator. It lets you do constant circulation if you want over here and basically just turn the heat pump on and off when we need heat input. So there's a real basic simple system that would work well in a, a slab on grade building, okay? Here's one a little more elaborate. Uh, again, these are pulled right out of Hydronics 27. We've got an electric boiler supplementing a split system air to water heat pump. We've got the tank and tank uh, here. So we're getting domestic water preheat in the inner tank, topping it off with the uh, electric water heater. And then we're going out here. We've got one manifold station doing home run circuits off to a variety of low temperature heat emitters. And I purposely threw another one in. If we're doing slabs in the basement, we could do a little motorized mixing valve and we could blend that water temperature down. You get these insul very well insulated houses. The loads on these basements are tiny. They might be 5,000 BTUs per hour at design. Water temperature requirements, 85 degree water at design. So we could, uh, we could mix it down for something like that, okay? And then one more, we wanted to include one here that has zoned cooling as well as zoned heating and domestic hot water. Uh, it's a monoblock. It assumes we've got antifreeze in the entire system. Uh, in heating mode, we are going through the buffer tank, okay? Uh, in cooling mode, though, 
we're going directly, this diverter valve basically determines, do we go to the hot tank for heating or the chill water side? Uh, you'll see there's no buffer tank involved in the cooling side, but I wanna stress here that we're, we're not undersizing the coils or these air handlers. We're making sure that if one of these is on, that our heat pump, and notice it stresses it variable speed heat pump, our heat pump can throttle back based on the temperature of the fluid leaving the heat pump. If we set that at, for example, 50 degrees, that compressor is going to slow down and try to monitor and maintain that temperature. And as long as our cooling load is not chopped up into a lot of little pieces, we'll be fine. And it could make a similar argument on the heating side as well. Okay, so again, if you're doing micro zones, put the buffer tank in. Real quick, you can do multiple air to water heat pumps. Okay, uh, we've got a pipe schematic in hydronics on this. Uh, basically, it's a four, a four pipe riser system. Each of these heat pumps can be independently controlled. Turn on and heating, turn on and cooling. And essentially, whatever the output of the heat pump is, it's directed into either the hot buffer tank or the chilled water buffer tank. And from there, we go out to uh, suitable chill water terminal units or I'm just showing some radiant panels here. And of course, it could be two heat pumps, it could be four heat pumps. I've seen systems that have upwards of six of these. There are larger capacity um, commercial units that go up, uh, get up into a three phase, 10 ton, 20 ton output configuration. So you're dealing with a 40 ton load, you probably aren't gonna put together eight five ton heat pumps. Uh, probably gonna put together maybe two 20s or four 10s. So the concept, of how to pipe those independently into these two different buffer tanks, you have the ability to do simultaneous heating and cooling. And that's it on my slide. Yeah, so, well, thanks everybody. Yeah, we had a good group here today, Siggy. Most of them hung on right to the last minute here. So thanks everybody for uh, joining us and supporting Cleppy. And um, unless you have anything else, Siggy, I think we're gonna wrap it up here. Um, just, uh, uh, I'm, you know, encouraging people to get hydronics 20. Yeah. So, well, thanks everybody. Yeah, we had a good group here today, Siggy. Most of them hung on right to the last minute here. So thanks everybody for uh, joining us and supporting Cleppy. And um, unless you have anything else, Siggy, I think we're gonna wrap it up here. Um, just, uh, uh, I'm you know, encouraging people to get Hydronics 27. Again, it's on the Cleffy website as a PDF. Uh, if you haven't registered for it, make sure you, you know, register, you can get the hard copy. Uh, it takes what we did today and drills down into even more detail. So it's, it's a good parallel with what we did. Yeah. All okay. right. Thanks, John. You're welcome. Thanks, Cody. Thanks, Milwaukee. See you guys and girls.